Welcome to Thinking Green. Uh, I want to let people know this show is not live. So unfortunately, much as you might want to, you can't call in and get an answer. But uh, we are taping it uh, on Friday, April 8th, and it's going to be aired on April 12th, on Tuesday night in our regular time slot. So there isn't much of a lag, but it, it, we just couldn't manage a live show. Um, a few weeks ago, um, Tim Hanser joined us on Thinking Green to give an overview of the budget process and what New London's budget looked like last year. And today he's back um, after we have more information because uh, Mayor Passero has presented this year's budget. And so we have some current numbers to look at as well as thinking about the budget process. So welcome back for part two of New Great. London Budget 101. Thank you. Um, so I guess uh, we can just start talking about just the framework, uh, sure. how to look at the budget. So I think the first thing I'll, I'll do is actually show people how they can find the budget. Uh, it is, uh, there is some information online. So if we can pull up the laptop screen, I can show. So this is the, uh, the City of New London's website. It's the, the URL is on the top. And if you look at the important links, which I'm going to kind of highlight so people can see where I am, which I think shows up pretty well. Right underneath it, it says Mayor's 2017 Proposed Budget. You can click on that document, and it will open, and you can download it to your computer. So what I'm going to do, since I already have it open, I'm going to actually pull it up for everybody as soon as I can find it. And here is what we have for that budget. Um, it's a 62-page document. It comes with a summary of appropriations um, as well as revenues with a mill rate calculation on the bottom. That mill rate is the same as this current year's mill rate. And then on the following 61 pages is a summary, of, or excuse me, detailed accounting of all of the revenues first, and then the expenditures second. Um, I'm not gonna go into all the details of this, but it is all there. I'll just do a quick kind of, to show people how to read it. This first one I have says taxes ad valorem, which is all of our tax uh, revenue. Um, the numbers correspond to a specific account. 110 means general fund, 1501 is uh, the accounting for taxes, and so on and so forth. What we have is we have seven columns. The first column is the actual amount of money we raised for these different lines in the fiscal year 2014. So that's July 1st, 2013 to June 30th, 2014. The next one over is for 2015. The next one is not how much we've raised, but how much was budgeted, because that's for the budget we're currently in. The next line, next column, is how much has been raised as of the printing of this document. If you look in the top corner, the date is March 23rd. I would guess that this number probably goes back a few weeks before that. So there's still more revenues to be collected. The next column is the mayor's request for this year. And the following column, the last column, is the difference between what he is requesting versus what was approved for this current year. And that's how the whole budget's laid out. I, mean, I could just kind of go to another page oh, to yeah, show. Oh yeah, the columns match up. Everything the matches down. up perfectly uh, with regards to that. This is still the revenues. And just to kind of pull up an expenditure, just to kind of show that that's, I know that probably is giving somebody a seizure at home. But uh, <laughs> if you look, it, this is a payroll line uh, for personnel. Uh, and it shows you the same thing. Um, so that's kind of how it looks. And that's all there is in this document. There is more detail. I spoke with the council president this morning about that. She said there is more detail. They were given more detail. If anybody would like further detail, she has been told uh, that requests go to the mayor's office. So if you want more information, call the mayor, email him. Uh, his phone number is 860-447-5200 is the main line for the city. Um, I believe his email address is mpassero at the URL that you see on the uh, top of the website, um, ci.new-london.ct.us, which is a mouthful. It would be interesting to know whether there's just there are a couple copies at the library because traditionally there have been. And I, there might even be a requirement for there for there to be so. 
Um, so just to kind of, I, I wanted to at least show people what that looked like. And before we delve into the details of that budget, I had two other towns to kind of compare sure. what their public can get off their website. So I have right here, I have the Groton budget, town of Groton budget. Um, this is a 300 page document compared to our 62 page document. And it has all of this information about what's proposed, what I really want to kind of scroll down to is it gives you some numbers, but it also tells you about positions, where the positions are going, what the landscape is kind of at the local level as well as uh, the, the, the state level in terms of their projections and their estimates. It gives the, 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 the public a great amount of detail. I can see the narrative is really surprisingly long. Right, and it's probably, it might be overkill, but it's really good information to have. There's a summary for each department. Here's public works, here's planning and development and what their changes were, and I believe there's justifications as well in it. Uh, this was just to point out how it looks different in other communities, and I was also gonna pull up East Limes, which is, their structure is slightly different, um, but if we go to the town of East Lime, it's actually on their website, and this is their proposed budget, and you could actually choose each department. So it's a clickable document, department by department, and it gives a lot of detail. Department by department, and then there's also summary pages. They also have information about um, kind of non-budgetary issues but are, that are relevant, that, that kind of work in the background, debt service, capital outlays, capital equipment, or capital projects list. Um, those are things we do not have available. Uh, I'm told that there's hard copy available, but we can't access it from our website. So just to kind of compare apples to apples and to say something's Something's not right here. It'd be really, I think, valuable for us to have that type of access like we... Traditionally, our website has not been our strong point in getting the information out. No, and I think we, we need to, you know, there, there, that's been a problem for a long time. And I think transparency is really important. Um, it takes time, energy. It's not easy to build these things. But um, if we want to have a well-informed public who's going to make decisions, especially with the history of a city who petitions its budgets, we should really be making a lot of efforts to to provide the information up front rather than requiring people to come chase you down for it. It would make sense. And, and people have become so accustomed to getting the information coming right into their homes. Right. And I think, yeah, when you look at pretty much anything, uh, anything in your life, you don't have to leave your home at this point for it. And that's a convenience we've become accustomed to and we've come to expect uh, it has its consequences. But... It's yeah. important. And it looks as though it, you know, the town of East Lyme is you know, probably not unique in, in its providing that in a pretty accessible way to anyone who wants to see it. Absolutely. So I think, should we go into sure. kind of what I saw in this year's budget? I just have a quick little, let me just pull this up. Um, so rather than getting into all those details, because there are a lot of details in that document. I wanted to kind of draw an eye to how the, how the revenues have changed and how the expenditures have changed. I'm not gonna go into detail on every change, oh. just, just ones that I think are, are substantial and or uh, substantive. So um, I have a handful on a document that I, if we could pull up. So this is, uh, this is our revenue stream. And um, we have six major categories for revenues there on the far left column, taxes, uh, permits and licenses, uh, intergovernmental revenue, which is mostly money from the state, which we talked a little bit about in the previous show, charges for services, fines and penalties, and miscellaneous. Um, what kind of stuff is under miscellaneous? You know, I, I can't remember <laughs> off the top of my head. We could pull up the document and, and certainly take yeah. a look. Um, when it comes relative to what we raise for right, funds, it's 0.3%. It's yeah, it isn't a lot. I it's was not a lot. Kind but of it, curious. There's, and there's actually a, a miscellaneous line under taxes. There's a miscellaneous line under intergovernmental revenue. None of them add up to very much money. Right. Um, so the taxes piece. So what I already said was there is no increase in the tax rate. The bill rate is proposed to be the same as it was last year. But if you look at this slide, it looks like we're we're raising taxes. We've gonna, we're gonna get $401,922 more oh. this year. Mm. And the reason for that, the primary reason for that is that 
the electric boat properties um, abatements have now expired, so they are right. now paying for their full assessed value. That's not all of it, but it's grand list growth, growth as opposed to a tax, yeah. tax rate increase. And just to kind of recall, so the last column is just the percentage where we get our money from. 56% is what we're getting our money from uh, proposed for this year. That's the same as last year as a percentage. Um, that's, that's uh, I guess, in that regard, while it did increase, it didn't really increase as a, as a ratio of other things. Right. I'm not going to spend much time talking about permits and lease licenses because it's it didn't change much. Uh, Six thousand dollars over four hundred thousand is not a very big difference. Um, and it is really a, a relatively small percent of our budget as well. Right, it's a half a percent. So when you look at it, taxes and in, intergovernmental revenue are our two big budget lines. They make up ninety-five percent of the budget. And for anybody at home who says, "But Tim, these numbers don't add to a <laughs> hundred." That's because of rounding. It's, uh, I could have taken them out to fr more decimal places, but uh, I didn't Our eyes think would it, glaze over. I didn't even think it was it terribly relevant to say it was point, point, uh, point 0.5 is actually not right. It's point 0.4862 or, or whatever the number turned out to be. But I wanted to talk about the intergovernmental revenue, if we could pull it back up. Um, that number went up $1.7 million, almost $1.8 million, one million seven hundred seventy four one ninety six. Now. That is based on changes to state aid. And I think we should talk about that. I'm going to get back to it in a little bit. But that's, a, that's substantial. Uh, it's also substantive, especially given the, the current state of the state's budget. Uh, there's an oh. enormous deficit that they have to close for next year, close to a billion dollars. And traditionally, when the state has had a budget deficit, at least part of that deficit just rolls downhill and the towns and cities get less. Right. And I, I think the challenge we face right now, so today is, is Friday, April 8th, this show will be shown in a few days, so it's possible things will change between those two days, but just on Wednesday, the Appropriations Committee approved changes to the budget that had implications on education funding. I uh, had a chance to speak with Representative Baumgartner about it. As far as he could tell, there was no impact to the city of New London, but the town of Groton lost $4 million. Oh my gosh. So and they're going crazy probably. He was going crazy. <laughs> um, $4 million uh, is a lot for any town, but it, it, it had to do with changes to the formula, and, and those are real, real concerns. It hasn't hit us yet, but that doesn't mean it can't. And so we should really be keeping a very close eye on the intergovernmental inter revenue. Um, I do want to go back to the taxes, if we can. Sure. Kinda. So just to break down uh, the three major sources of those real estate taxes, um, rather than give the, the numbers, I just gave the changes. So like I had said, real estate tax went up. Largely because of EB and the grand list right. going up. And it went up $965,000. That was the the bulk of the change, but I think the number that is also really worth looking at here is this bottom one, minus 650. Now, is that because of change in state law? Right. So the up until this past year, we all paid a motor vehicle tax that was based on the mill rate of the town in which we lived. Right. Which means that if I own a car in New London, and I were to just, just simply re-register it in, in Waterford, my taxes would go down. Yeah, probably a whole lot. Probably a lot, because the mill, the mill rate in Waterford is, I think, about half of what it is in New London. Um, there's legislation that changed that so that now the towns all pay the same mill rate. Now what we will see in the intergovernmental revenue is we'll see a $650,000 to the positive, meaning that the state is reimbursing us for this lost tax revenue. So this year, they're kind of making it a revenue neutral thing. Right. So far, yeah. So far, generally we don't see this amount of fluctuation in a um, in the second year of uh, state budget, but because of the uh, the challenges they've had with raising revenues, uh, we're seeing a lot of changes. So I just wanted to point out those two numbers, um, and we could talk about revenue because I think that's when it comes to the or governmental revenue, state uh, intergovernmental revenue, because those are really where the changes happen, and there needs to be a lot of questions to make sure we're not 
being excessively optimistic. So these are, uh, they're not all the budget lines. These are the budget lines that I thought were noteworthy to talk about in terms of their changes. If you see, there are one, two, three, four, five, six of them that went down, uh, and there are three of them went, that went up. And the three that mm -hmm. went up went up by a lot more than the six that went down. Okay, so you've explained the, the 600, plus 650,000. Right. That, that's that, the motor vehicle reimbursement. Exactly. But um, the, the pilot, uh, MRSA pilot, so what is that? MRSA seems to be a new uh, term. I'm, I'm guessing municipal, I don't know what the R is, state aid. Um, I, I'm assuming there were some changes in the pilot formula, mm -hmm. that that's where this number comes from. There must have been some new legislation about sales tax sharing, which is where that $900,000 number comes from. But without any backup, this is where not having the detail really hurts. If I were to go to Groton's budget, I would be able to say, okay, what are these, these changes? Okay, where's the, doc, where's, the, where's the language about why this change happened? And there'd be language there. We don't have that. So we'd have, you know, some state statute or formula change or something. Or uh, 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 an analysis from CCM, which is the Connecticut Council of Municipalities, uh, or one from OPM, the Office of Policy and Management, or the state legislature, or somewhere saying, here is the impact based on we've changes we've made. You can bank on this money. Now, with conversations I've had, I've been told that they're pretty certain that analysis has been done. But not having seen it concerns me. And I think we should all be concerned because it's a big number. And it, is. it has huge impacts on our budget. Uh, either we have to, if this $1.3 million does not come through, we either have to raise the money ourselves, which means an increase in the taxes, or we need to find $1.3 million in reductions throughout the budget. Which, as you know, is not fun. It's not fun, and if we don't find this out until November, for whatever reason, now you've only got seven months to figure it out. You've got a smaller window to make a big cut, and that gets very difficult. Anybody who, you know, if you had to do that in your own home finances, it would get very difficult. And the fact is, in our budget, there are a lot of costs that really you can't touch. You right. know, employee contracts have to be honored, whatever the state of the budget. Right. And, and layoffs, uh, which was actually talked about at the state level, the mayor, the, the governor has, has implied that there might be massive layoffs, and he's going to be presenting a, a new budget, which is a bit unprecedented, next week, Wednesday. So the, the day after this is taped, after and this is being uh, aired, and we, it, could, it could throw all this out the window. But one of the we'll things, just have to have a part three. We'll have to have happens. a part three. Um, but one of the things that's been discussed is that because of laws regarding um, paying out your accrued vacation leave because of uh, unemployment insurance, mm. the savings aren't as great as one would think. And, and, and actually, we had, we, I had to go through this exercise in uh, the spring of 2012 when the, the city's budget was uh, in pretty, sh pretty tough shape and the mayor wanted me to do an assessment of how to get to zero uh, how to get back to zero from negatives. And that was also a six or seven month window to work in, right? It was less than that. It was, we, we didn't do that exercise till probably February or March. So we were talking three to four month window. And it, it, to, to accomplish it after you factor out paying people's vacation leave out, paying unemployment, I mean, you'd have to get rid of half the staff, which clearly isn't gonna work because they, they are performing, they're providing services to the public. Yeah, we really do need the the services. Right. You can't, you can't just get rid of all your garbage collectors and somehow think the garbage is going to get collected. They won't. Uh, so there are real implications to that, that process. So the sooner we know this information, the better. Um, the more conservative we are in our revenue projections when it comes to getting money from the state, the, the safer we are. Uh, I think the, the best strategy with any budget is to always underestimate how much money you're going to get and overestimate how much it's going to cost you to do what you got to do. Because at the end of the day, the worst case scenario then is that you break even. Whereas if, you, right. if you're overestimating your revenues and underestimating how much things cost, the, the best case scenario really probably still leaves you in a deficit. And um, that's, that's a, we're in a precarious 
financial situation. We will probably be for a long time. Um, we can't afford to have those types of uh, deficits uh, built in or potential deficits built in just because we don't have control over what the state does. So more on this later as we, what the state's solutions will be, how much of an impact they'll have on our city. Right, right. Okay. And I just, um, I think the other number I wanna point out on this sheet is the education cost sharing. Now, it's a teeny tiny number, it's minus $5, which <laughs> I thought was really kind of a funny number, but really the reason I bring it up is that it, this, this is the major account that is, uh, comes from the state to fund schools locally. This, the number has actually dropped every year for the last five years. Not a huge amount. Uh, it, I don't think it's even $40,000 on the whole. But that's, a, I mean, even if you just assumed it was zero, yeah. cost, costs go up. Costs increase. Uh, natural gas prices went up a few years ago. That has implications on the Board of Ed's budget. Uh, there are contractual increases. There were, I don't know how many years in a row that teachers took no increase. They, they got zero increases. I think the whole time I was on the Board of Ed, the teachers were flat funded about three or four years in a row. Right. And they did get a 3% increase this year, but, and some may think that's high because it's above the level of, uh, of cost of living increase, but when you put it into context that they were getting zeros, it's uh, still quite low. But that's a cost implication. So the fact that the state is not really helping us when it comes to education cost sharing really means that they're hurting us. And especially when you look at those, those lines underneath it, there's, there's a public school transportation line, they're getting us $63,000 less, or mm -hmm. we're projecting to get $63,000 less. And there's a school project building grant, which wasn't entirely clear to me what it was, but nonetheless, it's $100,000 that the city right. does not project to get. And the public, I hadn't seen the public school transportation uh, cut but you know with our conversion to a magnet school district that could really have a major impact on, on us yeah no at this point we uh we've developed a model that almost requires everybody to take a bus to school now i know that if you're within a certain yeah. radius of the school you're not providing bus service um, right. but the reality is is that because somebody who lives in the third district could be going to winthrop school sure. they're getting a bus whereas previously they may have walked to school Yes, so really more and more students are being served by buses. And of course, with you know schools like the Friendship School that's in Waterford but s serves students in New London, New London is still paying the transportation right. for those students as well. Right, and in the short term, it may not have implication because the fuel prices are, have dropped and there might be a savings in the Board of Ed budget because they're spending less money on fuel. But we can't, we can't be guaranteed sub two dollar gasoline for or diesel fuel in this case. No, it's pretty unnatural, actually. Right. So that's that's an unlikely, uh, unlikely scenario for the long term. So this, while it may not have an imp implication this first year, it's something we should be making sure we keep an eye on. Okay. Now, so where where do we go from here? Well, I, so I think one of the, I think what's really important is that when revenues are discussed by the city council, um, that if the public goes to speak, is that they really make sure that the council is asking questions about these lines. They're saying, so I'm seeing this added $1.3 million in pilot. Can you show me how the administration came up with this figure? I wanna be certain that we're not being overly optimistic on funds. How, and, and the follow-up question would be, how can we be assured that in a year where the, where the state is likely to make massive cuts, which will have at least some implication on us, how can we be sure that we will actually get the revenues we put in here? Because the last thing we want to have happen is to be midway through the year and find out state monies we were counting on aren't coming in. So my goal of this, of this discussion isn't to, isn't to say these numbers are good, these numbers are bad. I'm just saying these are numbers that we need to ask questions about. If, if, the, if the mayor and the finance director say, look, you're right, we talked about this number, we've spoken with our representatives, we've spoken with CCM, we've, we've consulted the, the governor's office, wherever it is, we have documentation, we've done our calculations, we are very confident we're getting this money. Great. They've done their job, which is why they're there, and we are given assurances that the money's gonna come in so we don't have to worry about it in the future. 
So really, we just want to make sure that everybody's dotting their, dotting their I's and crossing their T's. I usually get that backwards. Um, so really, I think what I, want to, what, I, what I would like to see out of the discussion of revenues in the, kind of in the immediate uh, term is make sure that the counselors are asking these questions of the administration. And if they're not asking the questions, find ways to make sure those questions are being asked and make sure that they're being answered. More importantly, that they're being answered. And it sounds like as a general thing, New Londoners are kind of notoriously reactive to budget issues. It seems as though there are petitions more often than not. Right. And I, and I think the concern that I have about that this year is that because the budget was presented as a zero increase, Hooray. <laughs> Hooray. Everybody's <laughs> yeah. saying, oh, that's great. We don't have to worry about this. But you still have to make sure the numbers work. And uh, I, I, don't, I don't doubt that, that the administration and the finance office have looked at the figures, but it's also not too much to ask for the evidence. And all I'm asking for is evidence. So hopefully we'll get it. I, will, uh, I haven't had a chance to follow up myself, but I will. And if I get that information, I, that could be a part of part three as well. Right. Um, this is really, I want to make sure the public knows what's changing because those are the places really right now we could talk about and say, okay, you changed this. You have to have a reason why you changed it. What is your reason? What's your evidence? So let's make sure that we're, we're ensuring that we're getting what we're supposed to be getting from our elected officials. And also building in some kind of security because I don't feel conf confident that the state will make good on all its promises this year. No, I mean, it's funny when you look at this list, the second one on the list is Pequot Grant. And you know, that's, it's, um, the Pequot yeah. Grant was supposed to solve Southeastern Connecticut's problems. Maybe that's a bit of- Yeah, bit. education funding problems, I, I believe. Right, and, and the, the, the most impacted communities never got the funds that they were supposed to get. Never got the funds they were, they were assured to get. Um, New London is probably not the most impacted, but Montville. Yeah, Montville has been very, and, and Norwich. And Norwich, um, to, to some extent, uh, Preston Ledger, North Stonington, but really Montville and Norwich have been the most impacted. They got a lot of money, but not anywhere near what they were supposed to get. Uh, I was actually browsing the, the Mansfield budget the other day, and they, have, they get money from Pequot Grants. And Mansfield's nowhere near the two casinos. Yeah, they probably don't really need the money either. <laughs> no, I mean, Not. their total is about what we lost this year. So, I mean, from a yeah. scalar perspective, they're getting a lot less. But that's what happened with the Pequot Grant. It was supposed to be something that, that countered the negative impacts uh, of the casinos being built um, in terms of costs to those local communities. But instead, it got distributed throughout the state because state legislatures from those areas were really effective at getting the money funneled to their communities. So there's no reason to trust that the state won't uh, renege on its promises again. And, and we need really assurances uh, as much as we can from our local officials that they've, they've at least kind of you know, kicked the tires and made sure that this, these numbers are, are as real as they can be. And I would say in the long run, it's to, to really push our elected officials to ensure that we're getting the revenues we should be getting. We've never gotten the amount of education money we're supposed to get by formula ever. Uh, we've never, we've always been shortchanged. So is Bridgeport. So is Hartford. So is New Britain. So is New Haven. But towns like Greenwich get more than what they're supposed to get, and and that's a real that's an issue at the state level. We need to hold our representatives accountable for making sure that they're mm -hmm. doing what they can. They can't do everything, but at least to ensure that they're they're fighting the good fight for the residents. Well, I think at the state level, one of the challenges is, okay, a certain amount of funding gets promised through legislation and then the budget process happens and it just doesn't get funded. Well, that is part of the problem, but I think going back to the ECS, what I just brought up, the education cost sharing formula, there's a formula. And yeah. let's say the formula means that the city of New London gets $50 million, um, just, just for sure. argument's sake. If the money, if there's only enough money proportionally to give us $48 million, that's fine. We should get $48 million. But if Greenwich is supposed to get a, get a million dollars, they shouldn't get a million two right. when we're getting less than what we're supposed to get. And that's what's happened. That's, it's not simply that everybody's getting a percentage less than they're promised. It's that some are getting a percentage less than they're promised, mm. some are getting a percentage more than they are promised. And 
just to, uh, Greenwich is yeah. an extreme example of a community that really does not need the state aid. Um, they get more money than they're promised by the formula. And there's no real good explanation for this. The, and I, I will give the one explanation, and it's all about representation. If you don't have strong representatives in, your, in the legislature pushing for this, and you don't have the, 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 the grassroots support behind them, that's how you lose out on these things. The town of Mansfield is, is, has a reputation for having very strong representation, and if you look at the amount of money they get from the state, you can see the evidence right there. So with our even-year elections coming up, it is, uh, it, it, it is an issue that should be an election issue. Absolutely, absolutely. So should we go on to sure. expenditures? So I, um, I think I only did about nine or 10 accounts on expenditures. I'll switch, I guess I'll switch that slide now. Um, three, six, 10, 10 accounts. Uh, there are other ones that go up. There are others that go down. Uh, I was hoping to do a summary by department, but one of the things that changed this year was the fringe benefits. So FICA, health insurance, life insurance, uh, contributions to, the, to 401s and 457s, as well as uh, contributions for pension were put back into individual departments. So while those numbers haven't changed, they've relocated, which makes... You can't match it up. It makes an analysis very time consuming. And with a scanned copy of the budget that I can't even take and drop into an Excel spreadsheet, I would literally have to type every number in to do that analysis. So rather than do that, um, I, I tried to highlight specific accounts that I thought were relevant that I think there should be questions about. It's, uh, again, this comes down to, did the administration do their homework? If the administration can justify these expenditures, that's fine, but they should be required to justify them. So if you, if we, so we'll go to the, the spreadsheet. Sure. So if you look at the first line, it's mayor's office payroll. That goes up $37,660. I don't really know where it goes um, because there's no no documentation on the online version. I don't know if that's a new position. I don't know if somebody got a raise. I don't know if three people got a raise. Um, it's it's just thirty seven thousand dollars. And right now, as far as I know, there's only two staff members in the mayor's office that are paid for out of this account, and that's the uh, the CAO and the uh, his administrative assistant. I guess the third is the mayor himself. And the mayor didn't get a raise. That has to be approved by the council through a separate action. Um, so did the CAO get a raise of $37,000? Did the admin get a raise? Was it split between the two? Where is this number coming from? And what's the justification for it? Or did he add a position? We don't know. And that's, uh, that's a question that has to be asked. Um, finance payroll went up $243,754. Now, I do mm -hmm. know that the current fi the new finance director, uh, Don Gray, who was actually retired from the city, did get a raise above what uh, what uh, the former finance director, Jeff Smith, was making. It wasn't $243,000. Mm. So is this contractual raises? Which seemed a little high to me to be contractual raises. Is it new positions? What What is this number? It, it doesn't seem to really, there's no, there's no information with what's been provided to the public to figure this out on their own. So this is a question that needs to be asked. Where is this going? Uh, finance overtime went up $25,000. It doesn't seem like a huge number, but I'm looking at the payroll number. For overtime for a couple of employees, that would that start looking like a big number. It does. And um, there are times in the year where finance, the finance department is very busy. When, it's, uh, when it comes to budget prep time, when it comes to audit time, they're very busy, and it's conceivable that they need some overtime for that time of the year, but not the rest of the year, for the most part. And if they've added positions, shouldn't the number go down? I, these are just questions that need to be asked. Um, again, if the mayor can justify it, I think there's nothing wrong with it, but that question needs to be asked. And if he can't justify it, then it, should, it shouldn't be there. Police uniform services payroll went up $333,805. Now, I'm almost certain this, this is an increase in staffing. Yeah, there were a couple new positions, a right. few new positions. But we don't know how many. And the reason I bring this one up isn't simply because I'd like to know how many, because I think everybody wants to know how many. Sure. There are some who think we have 
already have enough cops. There are some who think we need a lot more. There are some who think we're, you know, we have way more than we need. Every one of those groups wants to know what this number means. Because if it's going up and people want more police officers, is it going up enough? If it's, if it's just somehow contractual increases, every, the other groups are going to say, OK, so that means that we're not getting new positions. Everybody wants to know this information. We just need the information. I'm guessing that's maybe five positions. But I believe it also includes contractual increases in payroll, which went, went up. Uh, I don't remember. I think they have a 2% increase this year. We just don't know. There was an increase in overtime services for uniform services. So uh, as well as more, st more staff people, the overtime is still up. Right. And I know last year, one of the, one of the lines that was challenged by, by certain members of the public was overtime in police and fire. And um, I don't think the, the previous administration really ever answered those questions. So that question still sits out there. Why is there so much overtime? Or what is the overtime being used for? Let's put it in a, in a more neutral perspective. Some, some feel it's perfectly justified, and that's fine. Provide the justification. And then the, other, the next two in pu the police were actually decreases. Uh, police investigative services payroll, I believe investigative services is the detectives. That looks like they lost a position. It does. But without, again, without the information, we don't know. And police support services payroll, that looks like we lost a position as well. Probably an administrative assistant. Um, these are questions that need to be asked. I would be interested to look at those four lines too and just get an overall idea of what the goal of our police department mission is. Right. And in that more detailed document is where that information lies. And this is where we all need to go ask the mayor for a copy. Uh, it's not there. If we were in Groton, we'd just go to the website. Or in East Lyme, we would just go to the website. And they would have that information right there for us, right on, right on the top. And they wouldn't have to kill countless trees to get it to us. And, and we wouldn't have, you, you know, if, if 20 people have the question, 20 people don't need to call the mayor's office. Right. And the mayor's office staff needs to spend their, their administrative time making copies and, and, and fielding these phone calls. It's an efficiency uh, uh, perspective as much as it is a transparency one. Uh, there's two lines I listed, in, or th well, really three lines in public works. Uh, the first one shows no change. So the first thought is, well, so what? It didn't change. But storm supplies, storm supplies is uh, salt, plow blades, things like that. Uh, the current budget is $62,000, excuse me, $65,000, and there was no change. If you look in the, in the budget, the year-to-date total, was $62,000. And we had a light winter. We had a very light winter. I, I think to call it light is, is an understatement. <laughs> we had a very light winter, and yet we still almost spent all the money. So it seems awfully optimistic to think that we would not spend more than $65,000 next year. Now, I'll ask you what um, the winter of 2014 15. What was the approximate amount spent on storm supplies you know, I, in a um, notoriously not light winter? I will. I, ha I have actually last year's budget, which would have those numbers in there. Let me see if I can pull them up quickly for you. But actually, why don't we go back? I'll, I'll look okay. through it. I could kind of do two things at once, and we can. I can answer that question. So, uh, public works solid waste other operating. Now, this is an obscure number, obscure, obscure name. It's actually a million dollar account. Um, and that is what we use to pay for our garbage to be disposed of in Preston. Uh, it's a tonnage figure. So we, charge, we, we get charged $58 a ton in Preston for them to take our garbage, burn it, and uh, make it no longer our problem. The number went down $196,630. And that reduction would put us at a million dollar request. The year to date, which we don't know exactly, but let's say it's March 23rd, was $783,000. Sounds like we're awfully close to hitting a million this year. The lowest actual we've had in the last six years is $1,174,617, which is greater than what we're budgeting. Yeah. So unless there's some other plan in place to drive 
numbers down, I don't see how that's going to happen. I'm guessing the amount of solid waste produced uh, remains fairly consistent from year to year. Perhaps recycling e efforts can be expanded, but I don't see that making that kind of major change. Well, actually, I can say that uh, tonnage has dropped um, every year for the last five years. Um, we've actually been rolling this number back every year. Uh, I rolled it back when I was in the department. Um, we were always very careful about this number, though. I would look at the trends, and we would never reduce it as much as what the trend would suggest we're going to see next year. The reason being that it doesn't take a lot for that number to go up. When we had, uh, when we had the blizzard, when we had the hurricane, um, excuse me, both blizzards, and we had the hurricane, the following month's tonnage went way up particularly after the hurricane, because people, were, people had damaged things and they threw them away. And that could, that could jump, the bud, jump the expenditures $100,000. So there are, real, there are real implications to changing that number. And when it's a million dollar account and you can have something go up 100000 or down 100000 it is far safer to overestimate how, how much you're going to get in tonnage and thus how much it's going to cost than to underestimate it. And once you get the bill, there's really no wiggle room. You have to pay it. Well, no, yeah, there absolutely is no wiggle room. We are, we are a member of uh, the Southeastern Connecticut Regional Resource Recovery Authority, um, SCARA for short. We are in a contract to pay for this amount. Um, it's not like we could even go somewhere else. We're not allowed to because we are, we are actually on the board of the authority. Um, so we are not allowed to go somewhere else and start shopping around. We actually pay lower tonnage rates than other parts of the state because Scara has actually been very well managed over the years. Um, they've retired their debt. They, they, they're really, it's really in good shape because there's been very conservative management of, of its funds. That uh, nobody has been overly exuberant about revenues. Nobody has, been, uh, nobody has under, uh, underestimated expenditures. And it, it's, it's a good model for us to follow. Be cautious and in the end, you keep your costs low and, and you, you, you can, you, you're on stable footing. So okay. jump back to the storm supplies, because the reason I, it took me a minute to find it is it's a, it was in a different line. The uh, fiscal year 13 budget, um, which if you recall was, uh, was the year we had the blizzard. So this number mm -hmm. does not include any money cost from the blizzard because that was set up in a separate account because we got FEMA revenue. Oh, right. So that was $87,770, and that didn't include the blizzard. So that was just the rest of right. the winter, which people may not remember. Uh, when, when, you, when you sleep on a cot for a few nights, you remember the winter. Um, that winter, with, with, oh. with the exception of, of Storm Nemo, was nothing really too bad. It was... Not as light as this winter, but it was not a heavy winter either. So that was probably on, a, on, on, you know, on balance an average winter, uh, maybe slightly lower than average winter when you take out the Nemo storm. And $88,000 was spent, and that was three mm -hmm. years ago. Prices go up. Um, fiscal year 14, which we didn't have a blizzard, but it snowed a lot. Yes. If anybody remembers fiscal year 14. Um, it was cold. It snowed a fair amount. Not not huge storm, storms, but just frequent. We spent right. two hundred and sixteen thousand dollars. That's a lot. It is a lot. Um, so with the no change on the storm supplies, that leaves us at you said a hundred thousand. Sixty-five. Oh, sixty-five. Ooh. Yeah, I should have put that on the slide. Fiscal year 15, what was budgeted was 118. Um, again, since we had a hurricane, uh, since we had a blizzard, it went into a FEMA account, so the numbers are different. Um, so I, I can't report on that uh, real clearly. But again, we budgeted $118,000. Um, we spent it, and then some. It was moved into an, a FEMA account. Thankfully, this, the federal government came in and helped us out. Had they not come help us out, we would have had big deficits there. These are not lines you play with. You can't predict the weather. And it's highly unlikely in my mind that we will have two consecutive winters that are light. 
And this one was, I think, just two s snowstorms that melted the next day. Right. And if you remember back to, I don't have the figures in front of you, but if you remember back to the 2011-2012 uh, the, the winter, it was also very mild. And what happened in 2012-2013? We had a blizzard. 2013-2014, we had... Just that steady... Which is steady and cold. 2014-2015, we had heavy and cold. And yes. uh, it just, you know, it just, these are hard things to predict. I'm not saying we should assume that we're going to get seven blizzards a year, but uh, this, the, the department has a long uh, record of what its expenditures are, both in this line as well as in its storm over time line. Those numbers are determined based on averages over the course of time. They're not, they're not arbitrary numbers. The number that was there this year was artificially low. Now they're proposing another artificially low number. It's one that exposes us to a deficit. Now, it might be $20,000 as a deficit. It might be $50,000. Or in the case of fiscal year 14, if we had this budget, it'd be a $160,000 deficit. And of course, that has to be make it made up some somewhere else. Right. And generally, what happens is the department has to find a way to make it up, which I don't, I don't disagree with as a concept. I think it's really important that departments are held responsible for their budgets. But it's very difficult to, to go to a public works director and say, well, since it snowed a lot this year, you didn't manage your budget well, you have a deficit. When it's, one had nothing to do with the other. Uh, you could have a mild winter and poor management and have a surplus. I guess we have to, I don't know, hire weather makers or something. We, weather could, put a, we, could, put a, we could put a bubble over the city. Um, sounds like an idea out of The Simpsons. It does. And then the last line is natural gas. Uh, natural gas is actually in the public works budget, so this was something I had to work on a lot. And it was a number that everybody liked to play with. And I never quite understood that one because, again, this is related to the weather. That if it's a cold winter, your natural gas bills go way up. So this year was a very mild winter with the exception oh of that one freakish three days where we got to minus five. Right. But other than that, it was... It was exceedingly mild. I think at our house, we've only used a single tank of oil. So... Uh, probably, I'm guessing it won't happen two years in a row also. Right, and I, I just kind of want to pull up the numbers that I have uh, historically for that. I'm just uh, sifting through my budget uh, to find them. But this, like I said, this is a number that, that everybody likes to tinker with. Um, the council liked to play with the number. The finance department liked to play with the number. And my staff and I kept saying, wait a second, what are you doing? We don't know how cold it's going to be next winter. The rates went up, or even if they didn't go up, they didn't go down. You're, you're budgeting more than what we had, la or less than what we had last year. Now, this, the number went down $60,000. The request, so the request total was $140,000. Now, if you go back the, uh, the, the six years that we've, uh, we've, I've got data, the lowest we've ever had for an actual, Actual is $186,000. So if we, if we hit our lowest, our record low, we'll, be at, we'll have a $50,000 deficit. And once again, that's a bill that just has to be paid. Right. Now, it's very possible, though I would guess unlikely, that there were some huge energy efficiency upgrades that can account for this. But that, like I said, that seems unlikely. I mean, this year alone, we've already spent $80,000, and it was a very, uh, through middle of March, and that is a very mild winter. These are numbers that we should be very cautious about. Um, if, if set up procedures to make sure nobody feels that they can touch them. I think there's nothing wrong with that. If it doesn't get spent, it doesn't get spent, and it doesn't get moved. But these are places where, through no fault of really anybody except Mother Nature, we can incur deficits in a line or surpluses in a line. Uh, nobody, sh nobody really deserves the blame or the credit unless they just made a bad decision when they budgeted. And this is another one where you look at your history. Where, what did we spend historically? Why do you think this number is gonna be below the historical value? And if you can't give a good answer, then that number needs to be pushed back up. Okay, the bad news is we're on our last five minutes. Oh my God. <laughs> so if you have more slides. No, that's oh, actually the last okay. slide. Okay, that's, that's good because we'll give up the laptop and 
So what, what haven't we covered that we have to cover? Uh, I think, you know, to, to be honest, I think that's the, the highlights of the budget. Um, there are several lines that I think more information needs to be provided. And I think that's the, that's the take home message. There are some, there, there are some people out there who are cheering that there's no budgeting, there's no tax rate increase, but there is an expenditure increase. And that means that if we don't have the same amount of growth next year, we're probably going to have a budgeting, a, a tax increase next year. It's and sometimes also, when you skip the years also, it's twice as shocking because it, it's a big increase. It can be. And the other piece is that we're counting on revenues that we don't have enough information to know whether that revenue is secure. So there really are issues there. There's lines that we don't know if the expenditures actually make sense. People need to be asking questions. If, if every one of the questions that I raised can be answered sufficiently, great. The, the staff did a great job preparing a budget that has no budget increase, no tax rate increase. But if not, you know, they really need to be, they really need to be held to task. So what's the next step for people yeah. who are watching the show? Uh, there are several meetings with the finance committee uh, of the council starting, uh, they've already started, but they have them every day, next week, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, I believe they're at six o'clock. You can look on the city's website for that information for meetings, upcoming meetings. Uh, certainly sending emails to the council, sending emails to the mayor, asking these types of questions, requesting a copy of the detailed budget from the mayor's office. Um, I think those are the next steps. Uh, and I would add basic, uh, related to what you were talking about before, talking to our legislators as well, to make sure the state doesn't do anything that impacts us Absolutely. in a negative way. Right. Okay, I think, I think we're kind of there for now. Um, this show is going to be uh, viewable on YouTube probably over the weekend. Uh, so if you're watching it next Tuesday, it's already going to be up there. Um, we have the channel on the screen. So it's on the New London Greens YouTube channel. Not only this show, but all of our shows from about the last year and a half or two years, uh, you can find there if you move through it. And um, on a totally different subject, um, we have like one minute left. Um, there's going to be a progressive happy hour on yes. Wednesday, yes. which is tomorrow if you're watching on Tuesday. Right. Um, and you can talk about that since you had some hands. Sure. So in there'll be a, there'll it. be a happy hour at uh, at the Oasis at six o'clock on April thirteenth. Um, the idea is just for people to meet and talk about uh, different ideas. There's no real format to it. It's just this idea that we can talk about local issues, we can talk about national issues, anywhere in between. Uh, really work on understanding where things are going, so we can all make good decisions. And it might be fun to look at the budget over beer. I don't know. That does not sound like fun. <laughs> no? No. Okay. Well, this will be better than that. It will be better. Um, well, thanks for watching. Uh, we'll be back live next Tuesday after this one airs. And thanks, Tim. And maybe we will get together in a, a phase three of this as, as more numbers evolve both from the state and the city. Yep. Sounds good. Well, thank you. Okay. Thank you.
Just as a friend.